Where did the magic mouse go? Oh, there it is. Okay, let's. The title slide is always weird. Make sure that the thing actually works. And nothing's happening. There we are. <clears throat> okay. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, some of you know Robert Ingersoll had the peculiar distinction of being uh, both an outspoken agnostic and also the most prominent political speechmaker for the U.S. Republican Party. In fact, during Ingersoll's public life, no one for whom Ingersoll declined to campaign, no Republican candidate for whom Ingersoll declined to campaign, ever attained the White House. So it was certainly interesting to, to come down Beverly Street today and see on the face of the building the proud sign of Center for Inquiry Toronto. I've been talking to Justin about fixing that spelling error, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> and next to it, an elephant. <laughs> almost, almost an omen of the things to come. <laughs> well, I'm here today representing the Center for Inquiry Transnational, as we call it, in Amherst, New York. It's the headquarters of a movement that has created centers for inquiry in cities across the world, including most recently here in Toronto. Now, we plan to add a lot more centers, although I'm not saying explicitly that this is our vision for the future. <laughs> although, who knows? But we're here today to celebrate the great North American free thought orator, Robert Greene Ingersoll. Uh, now let me tell you a little bit about Ingersoll. Uh, we're going to hear more than anyone could ever want to know about where he was born. So for now, just take it from me that he was. Uh, as Justin has noted, his father was a uh, relatively conservative preacher. Theologically conservative, but uh, an anti-slavery activist, an abolitionist, years before that position was popular even in the North. In fact, uh, Ingersoll Sr. would get uh, a job at a new church, and he'd tell a few abolitionist sermons, and he'd be looking for another new church. So the, the family, the family literally relocated a couple of times a year. Uh, during Ingersoll's childhood. Uh, by the time Ingersoll was in his teens, uh, the family was in Waukesha, Wisconsin, and just a little bit west of Milwaukee. And there Ingersoll had his first encounter with the poetry of Robert Burns, uh, which sent him on his odyssey of uh, intellectual and literary exploration, uh, and eventually his, his complete break from organized religion. Uh, Ingersoll was in many ways a, a contradictory character. Uh, he was one of the most prominent American trial lawyers and secured acquittals for his clients <coughs> in some of the uh, highest, uh, highest profile legal controversies of the day. Uh, won, a, uh, uh, won acquittals in what's called the Star Root Trials, which was kind of the Watergate scandal of its day. It was a national level scandal about the distribution of uh, postal routes uh, for which the government paid extra fees and of course people were pocketing the fees and what have you. Well Ingersoll uh, uh, got his clients acquitted on the strength of a summation to the jury that went on for two and a half days. Yeah. <laughs> that man could talk. Uh, he had uh, a couple of dozen uh, lectures in his repertoire. Most of them ran around three hours. And during his public life, which ran from roughly the end of the Civil War till shortly before his death in 1899, he crossed the country speaking to packed houses in the largest theaters of the day, uh, sometimes lecturing on Shakespeare, sometimes lecturing on science, sometimes lecturing on women's rights, but usually and most popularly lecturing on his stance toward religion. Ingersoll was an agnostic, he did not believe in God, he did not believe in the social power of the church, and he felt in particular that the doctrine of eternal punishment was just absolutely beneath contempt. Uh, it was probably heard and seen by more people than would hear or see any other individual until the advent of mass media in the 20th century. 
probably more people came out to see Abe Lincoln when he went on the stump, but Ingersoll was active a lot longer. Uh, and over his almost 40 year career, uh, just an amazing, amazing impact. Unfortunately, while he was at several times the uh, president of some of the then existing national free thought organizations, he never created an organization of his own, and a great deal of his legacy was lost, but not all of it. Well, Ingersoll was born in West Central New York State in 1833. Now, this region is so rich in sites relating to the history of free thought and radical reform that we've established an informal free thought trail connecting them. There, as you can see, our logo is animated. Uh, all of the city names that are in green are sites that are on the Free Thought Trail. Now, Ingersoll was born in Dresden, New York, a village on the west shore of Seneca Lake. Uh, population in 1833, about 300. And its population today is about 300. <laughs> Ingersoll was born in this house in 1833. He would live there only for the first four months of his life when Daddy would get run out of town on a rail. Well, not a real rail, but you know my trip. Well, it may not look like that much, but it's the only museum open to the public anywhere in America that is devoted solely to atheism, agnosticism, humanism, and free thought. It's also the only of Ingersoll's many residences that still stands. Uh, Ingersoll became very successful. He moved to New York and Washington, D.C., lived in elegant townhouses, and after his death, other things got built on those properties. Uh, Ingersoll had an elegant row house on Gramercy Park, which was torn down in the 1920s to make room for the Gramercy Park Hotel. Uh, and there's, there's a long chain of these. All of Ingersoll's residences in Peoria, Illinois, where he first uh, came into public life, have been raised. So out of all of them, this is the only one, and it's where he lived only the first four months of his life. Well, uh, one of the organizations that I work for, the Council for Secular Humanism, saved the house from the Wreckers Ball by buying it in 1986 or hold on tight, the princely sum of $7,000. Uh, when we get into the video, you'll get a chance to see why we only paid $7,000. <laughs> uh, we immediately got it onto the U.S. National Register of Historic Places, winning a breakneck competition with the pizzeria next door, which wanted to knock it down for a parking lot. The museum is still there, the pizzeria is not. And I suppose there's a Darwinian message in that for us all. Well, we, so we got the house on the National Register, we dealt with that pizzeria, uh, and we raised and spent more than $250,000 restoring our $7,000 fixer-upper. <laughs> it's been open to the public each summer and fall since 1993. And if we can switch over to the DVD player now. Uh, when you, you visit the museum in Dresden, and I, those of you who haven't, I hope you will at some point, one of the first things you see is an orientation video, uh, which I produced back in 2003, and we can run that at this time.